so what I'd like you to do to start is just paint a picture for what life will be like for humans in the year 2053. Certainly, Don. So the type of futurist that I am is I'm an applied futurist. So I work with organizations to model possible and potential futures 10 to 15 years in the future. And then I work with them to say, okay, what do you need to do today, tomorrow, five years from now to actually make that future happen? So I'm a very particular type of futurist. So this notion of sort of looking out to 2053 and sort of making predictions, um, I'm not really good at that. Maybe I should have told you that before we, before we got on the podcast is that I don't really make predictions. You know, so much of what I do as an applied futurist is work with organizations, with people to think about what, what is possible and then how to enable them to kind of get there. One of the, the quotes that I always love using, um, and I use it in a lot of talks that I give and I use it with my students is from Isaac Asimov. Um, and he has a great way of sort of thinking about and talking about how what predictions are for the future, what it means to predict the future. And for for those non geeky people out there, Isaac Asimov is certainly a science fiction writer, but he was also called the great explainer. And he was a great nonfiction writer and wrote a lot about sort of different science and different ways of thinking about the future. So it was a big inspiration for me. So he had this great quote that basically roughly says that predicting the future is a hopeless, thankless task with ridicule to begin with, and all too often scorn to end with, or something like that. And so I always tell people, if you want to be a futurist, know that, that that's what you're walking into is sort of that world. So for me, I don't really make predictions. I don't really go to say this is what it's going to be, because I try to tell people that the future is built by them. And so a lot of it is me pushing back on them, sort of saying, well, what do you, what do you think? What do you want the future of 2053 to look like? Um, and I think that's really important because I've been doing this now for about 25, 30 years. And so I've seen that happen. I've seen the future because I do 10 to 15 years into the future. I've seen it begin to happen. And so that's the thing that I've learned. And it's made me very humble. And why I love talking to people about it is say, OK, well, what kind of future do you want? What do you want 2053 to look like? What do you want 2073 to look like? Because we have that ability to do it. People communities, organizations, corporations, governments have the ability to build it. So for me, even the grammar of the question is really hard because it's like, well, we don't know. And we have the ability to shape it. And that's oftentimes when people talk about the future, like going to 2053, they're like, well, what, what will it be like in 2053? How do I prepare for 2053? And they talk about it like Des Moines, Iowa, like we're all going to Des Moines, Iowa. And everybody wants to know how to what do we need to wear in Des Moines and where what's a good place to eat in Des Moines? It's like we're all headed to the same place. And the fact that and let me tell you, I love Des Moines, Iowa. I do a lot of work in farming and the future of farming. It's a beautiful town, but you may not want to go to Des Moines. You may want to go to Seattle. And so and that's fine as well. And so I think there's this much more varied sense of what the future could look like and what it will be like to live in 2053. But I'm not going to dodge the question 100%. So I will tell you, so in the work that I do, and as I look out to 2053, one of the things that I know for sure is the dirty little secret about the future. When people say, what will the future look like? And the dirty little secret about the future is the future is going to look a lot like today. It really will be. Even if you look back 50 years, 100 years, how we live, the world that we live in, how we dress, the houses that we're in, many of the houses that we live in were actually around 100 years ago. And we actually pay more money for those than not. Because I tell people that that's the dirty little secret. Because if you walked out into 2053 or even 2073 and you were in a Blade Runner future or you were in the Jetsons, we call that a nightmare. That's a terrible thing. It would be, you, it would be so bad. Because the thing is, is we're trying to make our lives comfortable. And so that's what humans are. And so, so much of what we do now, don't get me wrong. There's going to be a lot of things underneath with technology and business models and climate and energy. A lot of that's going to change, but how the future will look like what it will look like. That's the thing I try to calm people with is to go, it's actually going to look a lot like today. So that's my answer, Don. Well, let's, let's talk about that for a minute because to look forward, let's say 30 years, like what we're talking about here, 2053, it can be helpful to look back 30 years and look at 1993. And I've been thinking about this a lot is like, what was life like in 1993? And you're right. We lived in houses. We rode buses. We were on trains. We had cars and things like that. But there's been some huge technology shifts 
So I think about riding the bus in 1993, which is what I did, or the first time I went to New York, I rode the subway, and people looked at magazines and they had books. And now you won't see that. You'll see almost exclusively people on their phones, whether it's consuming content, listening to music, reading the news, things of that nature. And so, you know, the technology has really shifted our attention spans, how we look for jobs, how we look for love. And in and, and that way, the technology, uh, that that's the biggest change that I've seen over the last 30 years. And certainly over the last 15 years is just mobile technology and social, those uh, uh, social technologies, so social media, and then also social advances that I didn't think were possible going back to 1993. So for example, being gay, you know, my gay friends, many of them were in the closet, certainly at work, but even with their families. And now that that has changed really dramatically as well. And so I don't see the technology changes slowing down and I don't see the social changes slowing down either. Um, and I wonder if you would agree with that. Well, from a from a social standpoint, I'm more of a technological futurist. I think, you know, certainly as we move from generation to generation to generation, we are seeing sort of those shifts and geopolitically seeing some really interesting shifts and then cultural shifts with that. But I think what's for me, what I kind of tuned into with what you said is that if we go back to that subway and you took a picture of you on that subway in 93 and you and by the way, I lived in New York in 93. And then if you took a picture today and you blurred it just a tiny bit, it would look almost exactly the same. People would be looking at something and they would be looking at something. And I'm not actually saying you're wrong. I'm actually agreeing with you because the idea, though, is that they're probably looking at the news or they're probably playing a game or they're probably doing set. But it's something to distract themselves from there uh, while you're on the while you're on the subway. And so the, the thing is, is that that really hasn't changed very much. Now, certainly the technology is. But I, I want to go back to because I think you are really, really right when it comes to how we find love, how we order dinner how we get from A to B. I mean, this is one of the things. So back in 1993, and I have a, a good friend who kind of points this out to me all the time. If he had told you that you could today stand in your living room and say, Alexa, Siri, or whatever, I want a pizza. And 15, 20, 30 minutes later, a pizza shows up at your door. That's magic. Back then, that's magic. You've asked for, you've asked a genie for something and it just shows up. So in that way, I, I sort of agree with you. And even so how we find love, how we connect. But see, that's what's really interesting to me is the world itself, the majority of the world hasn't changed that much. But how we connect with each other, that has changed, right? But we still have to eat dinner. We still are looking for love and companionship and friendship. We're still looking to be distracted by books or games or movies. That doesn't change. But it's the how we're kind of connected to people and what that connection looks like. And that's what technology has really done over the last 30 years has really changed. And, you know, I was that's what I was building those technologies back in 93. And that's sort of been the arc of my career is sort of doing that type of work. And it's connecting people in really kind of interesting and different ways. And that's what technology is really good at. And that's what it will continue to do. That's, I think, what we'll continue to see. But that's, for me, the thing that's so important is always to remember that it's not the technology, that if you look at the humans, it's always about the humans. And if you look at the humans, we don't really change that much, but we are using technology in really interesting ways that is culturally changing us little bits here and there. <laughs>